The God we worship is the God who made us and sustains us every day. He's the God of the Bible. He's the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. But what we've also been seeing is he's the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, and the God of the 12 tribes of Israel. And as we think about these characters, we've, we've looked at Abraham, we've looked at Isaac, today we're going to look at Jacob. And as much as we need to know the stories of these characters, it's really what is on our heart is that we'll know the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, uh, his deep work that he longs to do in our lives. And, uh, and then following that series, we'll be going back to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 10 gives us some really good reasons why we need to be not just New Testament Christians, but whole of Bible Christians. Because the Old Testament so much gives us the background to the New Testament, the fulfilment is in the New Testament of all that God wants to tell us in the Old Testament. And in 1 Corinthians 10, in the message, he says, Remember our history, friends, and be warned. All our ancestors were led by the providential cloud and taken miraculously through the sea. They, they went through the waters in a baptism like ours. They all ate and drank identical food. They drank from the rock God's fountain for them, but just experiencing God's wonder and grace didn't seem to mean that much. They fell into many temptations during the hard times in the desert, and the same thing can happen to us. We've just got to be on the guard so that we never get caught up in wanting our own way as they did, and falling for immorality as they did, and turning our religion into a circus. We must never try to get Christ to serve us instead of us serving him. And so 1 Corinthians 10 says these are warning markers for us uh, in our history books written down so we don't repeat their mistakes. You're not exempt. You could fall flat on your face as easily as anyone else. Forget about self-confidence. It's useless. Cultivate God confidence. And underneath these characters, I want us to see that it's faith in God and God's perseverance with each of these characters. And that's just as true for each one of you. To respond in faith to this God of Jacob. And to believe that God, just as God persevered with, uh, with Jacob, he's persevering with us to fulfil his calling in our lives. So today, in a sense, um, if, if you want to get one thing out of today, it, it's that God can meet you just as he met with Jacob in the midst of a messy family. Now, as I thought about it, the more I looked at the story of Jacob, and Jacob actually goes from Genesis 25 through to his last words in Genesis 49. So we've got a lot of chapters to cover today, but, uh, but don't worry, we'll just be uh, looking at a few instances from the life of Jacob. But let me encourage you to read the story of Jacob, to just sit down and read that story from Genesis 25 through to 49. Forget the chapter divisions, just read it as a story because God gives us that story for our benefit, for our blessing. Not, as, not just as a, a sort of a moral story in a sense, but to show a life of growing faith and to show how God met him in the midst of an incredibly messy family life. And uh, your, your immediate family may not be so messy, but I'm sure that every one of us has got messes in family, in extended family. And God wants to meet us there, not necessarily solve all the problems. Uh, there may be things that will go on forever, but he wants to meet us 
and help us to walk with him in this. So let's first of all look at um, uh, Jacob and his, and his family. And these characters in the Bible, God gives us, they're, they're real people. God hasn't sort of polished up Jacob's life to put it in the Bible. He's real, just, just like we are. And, uh, and so God, and, and in the New Testament, um, Jacob comes up in the New Testament in Hebrews 11, in verse 20, by faith Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come. And by faith Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph and he worshipped, leaning on the top of his staff. And in Romans, there's a, there's a particularly hard passage to understand, but he says, um, this is the statement in Romans 9, 9, the statement of the promise, at the time I will come and Sarah will have a son, so this is Abraham and Sarah, and not only that, but Rebecca, Isaac's wife, conceived children through one man, our father Isaac, for, through her, for though her sons had not been born yet or done anything good or bad, so that God's purpose according to election might stand, not from the works but from the one who calls, she was told the older will serve the younger. Jacob and Esau were twins, but Esau was born first, so he was the older, possibly only by a few minutes, but Esau was the older, but the older will serve Jacob the younger. As it is written, I've loved Jacob, but I've hated Esau. And this can be a hard saying to understand, but I think what helps if we see that right from the start, right through both the Old Testament and the New Testament, salvation has always been by grace. Sometimes people will say to me, oh, you know, the Old Testament, you had to obey the law and work hard with the law, and the New Testament, now it's all by grace. But salvation has always been by grace through faith. Abraham was made righteous because he believed God. And so what shall I say then? Is there any injustice with God? Absolutely not. It does not depend on human will or effort, but on God who shows mercy. And so underlying Jacob, as we look at all his deceit and his carry-on, underneath he believed God. He put his faith in God. And Jacob's brother Esau, one of the, uh, when I looked up Esau in the Bible dictionary, it had a little phrase there, he lived for the present. He lived for the present. And Esau made so many choices that left God out of the picture. He let Jacob, he, he, Esau came in from the field. He was tired, he was hungry. And Jacob says to him, sell me your birthright for a meal. And, uh, and he let Jacob buy his birthright, the idea of this spiritual leadership uh, in the home. And anything to do with, with God, he was meant to be the leadership of that in the family, in life. And he sold that right for a meal. He sold out so cheaply. And in a sense, we have to be careful. It's so easy to sell out cheaply for the things, things of the world, the influences that we allow in, in our families uh, in our own lives. You know, I uh, was talking with a family the other day uh, and they, um, uh, they, they limit the screen time that their children have. And it's not, it's not that you're anti-technology, but you've got to recognise the influence that some of these things have that we're not selling out cheaply. I mean, on the news they've been talking about... Um, an age for social media. And uh, it's not that social media is wrong, but we can't be naive about the influence that social media can have on the next generation, on our own lives, with thinking of the image we've got to present to the world. 
that's, that's, that can be just as deceitful as, as Jacob. But, but what's the, what am I allowing in my own life and in, in the lives of our family that we just can't sell out cheaply for, uh, for, for, for things that are just so, that could be so good but can become so wrong? Sin often distorts good things. And, uh, and Esau, when we look at Jacob, in a sense, we've also got to think about Esau. And, uh, and Esau also appears in Hebrews chapter 12, where he says, uh, Make sure that no one falls short of the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up, causing trouble and defiling many. And make sure there are no immoral or irreverent person like, like Esau, who sold his birthright in exchange for a single meal. For you know that later, when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, even though he sought it with tears, because he didn't find any opportunity for repentance. Jacob, yes, Jacob was deceitful, but Esau was willing to sell his birthright for just for a single meal. And I think God gives us that as a warning to think through what we're doing and are we selling our birthright, all the opportunities God's given us for things that will not last. And then Esau goes off and gets married. He took his wives and it says in Genesis 26, 35, they made life bitter for Isaac and Rebekah. And, and, uh, and, then, and then they send Jacob off to get married back, not, uh, it's sort of not to the local people, but in the godly line. And Esau looks at that, ooh, great. And he rushes off and gets married to some more wives. And there's no sense in Esau of the preciousness of marriage. And when you neglect your birthright, when you say no to all that God wants to do in your life, it becomes easier and easier not to follow God. It, it's the tragedy. But I think that one of the problems in the family life was that I, it says that Isaac loved Esau because of his venison, because of his food. And Jacob was loved by his mother. It, it's, it's a tragedy when favourites come into family life. And, uh, and, and when you have favourites, your children can be so easily become people pleasers, not living for a principle, but living so that they can make uh, an, an impact on you and try and win over your favouritism. And then the parents get bitter and angry instead of realising they're much to blame, just as with Isaac and Rebecca. You know, when you have children, and, uh, and we've, had, we've had five, and, and they're all incredibly different. G'day, John. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and, and some people will be like you, and, uh, and, and some, some people will be quite, some of the children will be quite different. And the, the, the danger is that you can, you can sort of uh, relate better to the ones that are like you. And God, God's not partial. God doesn't have favourites. And so we've got to be very careful about that. And I think that's one of the warnings that this story of Jacob gives us. Because, you know, Isaac preferred Esau, you know, because of the food. You know, he, uh, Isaac sold out pretty cheaply. And, and, then, and then Jacob will have a favourite in Joseph. And think of all the mess that that creates in, in his family. And then another thing the story of Jacob tells us is you've got to work together as husband and wife, as father and mother. Um, 
you know, here they were scheming. We'll see later on when, when, uh, when Isaac wants to bless Esau and, and, and uh, Jacob comes in, that uh, children know how to divide parents and uh, they know how to work their way through it. And, and so fathers and mothers have got to be so united in the way that we, we talk about our families and the way we work together on it. And, and then I think, too, coming down quickly on deception. Our children are going to do wrong things. I mean, as never did. But our children are going to do wrong things. And what we, it's, not, it's not so much the wrong thing, but when there's deception. And we've got to really help our next generation not to be deceivers to be open, to be honest, to be transparent, to be open. And that's where parents have got to learn more and more. We need to learn to be open, to be transparent with our children, that we're not presenting that we are perfect. You know, I can remember one of our sons came to us with a real problem and uh, I didn't know what to do. And the Lord said, why don't you just pray with him? And let's ask God together. And, and I think when I look back on that, that was in some ways, that was a bit of a turning point in our relationship. That I was honest, I didn't know what the answer was, but I knew God knew the answer. And we could pray about it together and work through what was going to happen. You know, even in things like a will, we know there are families where there's just been great partiality in the will and, uh, and nothing is known until the person dies and it just makes the mess bigger and bigger. I say that because just from personal experience in, in the extended family, what a mess it makes when we're not open and transparent. Now, I, I know that it, children grow into it but my appeal is to be open, to be honest, to be transparent, that there are no surprises. Jacob runs for his life because Esau wants to kill him. Great, great family. And he meets God at Luz with a vision of a ladder and angels ascending and descending. You know, we had a sermon once in the city with a men's group and... Um, and the fellow shared how this story of the ladder between earth and heaven and our salvation is not about us trying to make a ladder and climbing step by step with our good works to God. God has provided the connection with eternity through his son Jesus. And we, by faith, uh, enter into that. But... Jacob recognises that God has been with him, that in the midst of this mess, in the midst of him, in a sense, having to run from his brother who wants to kill him, God is with me and God comes to him. And in the midst of the messes that God takes us through as family life, God will come to us and we can know his presence and his, his, his guidance and his leading. Jacob says in, in Genesis 28, 20, If God will be with me and watch over me during this journey I'm making, if he provides me with food to eat and clothing to wear, and if I return safely to my father's family, then the Lord will be my God. He's not quite there in faith yet. He's starting to put some conditions upon God, but he's entering in to a relationship with God. And I know sometimes I've wanted to believe God, but I've put some conditions on it. And God longs to totally release us, that we can just trust in Jesus totally for every situation, however hard it is, that God will take us on. But at least he's going down the direction of faith. Esau just continued to live for the present and made really bad choices. 
So then that's Jacob and his messy family. Jacob wrestles with an angel. It's, it's an amazing story. After working for many years, Jacob ends up with, uh, with his, the 12 sons who are going to become the 12 tribes of Israel. And God says to him in Genesis 31, go back to the land of your ancestors, to your family, and I will be with you. But he had to run from his father-in-law Laban and he has to go near where Esau now lives, his brother, twin brother, who wants to kill him. And God appears to Laban and says, don't you touch Jacob. You know, God often works behind the scenes in ways we don't always see or know about. But he does some beautiful things. And Jacob hears that Esau's coming with 400 men and, and he's afraid. Well, well, I would be, I would be too. And uh, it says uh, in Genesis 32, Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed. So he's still a bit at the scheming stage. He divides his camp in, into groups. Well, if they get that one, uh, the other ones will be able to uh, get away. But he prays a beautiful prayer in Genesis 32. God of my father Abraham, God of my father Isaac, the Lord who said to me, go back to your land and to your family, I will cause you to prosper. I'm unworthy of all the kindness and faithfulness you've shown to your servant. God is starting to change Jacob, just as he longs to change our lives, to see more and more of the kindness and the faithfulness of God. I'm unworthy of all that kindness. I crossed over, my, over the Jordan. When I came over the Jordan, I only had my staff, my stick, and, and now I've become all these camps of people. Please rescue me from my brother Esau. And, and, and Jacob was left alone. And, he, and a man wrestled with him till daybreak. And when the man saw that he could not defeat him, he struck Jacob's hip socket as they wrestled and they dislocated his hip. And Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And there comes times in our lives where we're alone with God. Let me encourage you to get some times alone with God. We need the fellowship. We need gatherings. But we also need times where we can just talk alone with God and allow him to speak in, into our hearts. And Jacob said, I'll not let you go unless you bless me. And the man said, what is your name? Well, the last time Jacob got asked his name was when his father Isaac said, what is your name? Who are you? And he pretended to be Esau so that he could get the blessing for life. And this time round, he says, my name is Jacob, the one who supplants, the one who deceives. That's what Jacob, in a sense, means, the one who grasps and hangs on and schemes. And God says, your name will no longer be Jacob, it'll be Israel, because you've struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. And Jacob again realises, I've seen God face to face. And, uh, and the sun shone on him as he passed by Penuel, and Jacob was limping because of his hip. And I don't want to over-spiritualise Jacob's limping, but there is a sense in which you can't really meet with God and not be affected not be affected in some way. He speaks to us about things and we learn to listen. Uh, I had a friend many years ago who was on a great uh, career path as an accountant. Nothing wrong with being an accountant. And uh, he, was, uh, he was on this incredible career path and really doing well. And, uh, and he, but the thing was, he was working for a large uh, gambling uh, betting organisation. And he actually wasn't doing the gambling. He, he was doing the tax returns and uh, payroll and things like that. 
And, uh, and he started to wrestle with God about it. And uh, he would say to God, well, it's perfectly legal. The government allows this organisation to operate and we pay our taxes. It's a fantastic career in accounting. But he started to see what is this organisation doing to people? And, uh, and, and, what's, um, and, and would I want my family to embrace the product of the company that I'm working for? And he left, but it was sort of, he looked back, it was like he left with a limp in his career. But it was a beautiful limp, because he felt he was doing what God wanted, and God provided. And sometimes I want to say to you, your children may not be able to do everything that other children do, because you realise the influences that come to bear upon them as they grow up if you allow them to do certain things. And whether it's, you know, like growing up, we realised, well, you know, things like uh, activities that can get in the way of the good influences for good upon their lives. There's so much pressure. And uh, I just want to say, I think it's better to walk with a limp and follow God and meet with God than it is to have everything. And your children will bless you in the years to come. That's Jacob and his family. Jacob wrestling with God. Finally, Jacob at the end of his life. This is all we can do to cover 25 chapters in 25 minutes. But uh, Jacob... At the end of his life, I, I've learned, Ruth and I have in a sense have learned never to say never to God. Perhaps we're still learning. But I can look back and see that as God has led us, he's never, we've never been disappointed. God has always provided. And Jacob, he's got a messy life, messy family, but faith comes through. And, and probably it's more that God persevered with him. As step by step, his faith started to blossom. So he comes to the end of his life. He ends up in Egypt. We've ended up here in City Light. God does some beautiful things that we're so thankful for. Our children end up in other suburbs, in other states, in other countries. And Jacob, you know, thinks his son Joseph is, uh, is dead, but he meets him and the boys in Egypt. And, uh, and he looks back over his life and he says, he says, the God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked, the God who has been my shepherd all my life to this day, the angel who has redeemed me from all harm, May he bless these boys. God took Jacob through so much. But step by step, he took the pathway of faith and trust in God. And so unlike his brother Esau, who lived for the present. And God says in Hebrews 13, I will never leave you or abandon you. Therefore, we can boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? And he goes on to say, remember your leaders who have spoken God's word to you. As you carefully observe the outcome of their lives, imitate their faith. And Jacob had come to the end of his life He'd seen that God had been his shepherd. And there's something for us to think about. It's so easy to make decisions based on now. Instead of thinking, what's, it, what's the end of this? What's this going to result in? Don't live today for the present. There's, there's a precious verse in Proverbs. Proverbs 19, verse 20. Listen to counsel and receive instruction so that you may be wise later in life, or literally in the end. 
And so God would say to us, listen, listen to God, listen to others who can give you advice on how to be wise in your latter end. Jacob learned to listen to God and and the schema within him took a long time to disappear. But in a sense, someone said faith, the, the, to, when I really start to have faith is when I stop scheming about how I'm going to work out my own life. And I'm going to put my life in, in God's hands. God changed him and changed even his name from Jacob to Israel. So there's a sense in which Abraham represents that first generation of Christians who are worshipping idols and God calls them and they come to follow God. And Isaac is sort of like the person who grows up in the Christian home and, uh, and follows God. And then Jacob, the third generation, what will happen? Will it be like Esau that the third generation lives for the present? Or will it be like Jacob, that despite all that deceitfulness, those straight out lies, he puts his faith in God and God becomes his shepherd. And every generation has to respond in faith to enter into all that God has for us. It just can't be us working it out itself. And so my encouragement to you this morning is in the midst of the mess of family life, believe that God wants to change you more and more to become like him. And uh, by faith, enter in to God's plans for your life. Let's pray. Father, we're just very thankful for the story of Jacob and all that you'd want to teach us. And help us to grow in our faith, to believe you for great and mighty things for changes in our lives, in our families. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.